Uh, John Park is the Product Management Group Director for Advanced Semiconductor Packaging at Cadence Design System. He and uh, his team are responsible for defining cross-domain solutions and methodologies for IC package and PCB co-design and analysis. So uh, welcome, John. All right. Thank you. Uh, well, thank you for this opportunity to, to speak today. Um, that the uh, title of my talk today is really focusing on some of the challenges, uh, both from a semiconductor designer's perspective, as well as package designer's perspective, as we move into this new world of three-dimensional heterogeneous integration. So the outline for my talk, I do want to spend a few three or four slides talking about uh, our perspective on some of the trends that we see happening uh, in the space of electronic design um, and hopefully clarify some uh, definitions around technologies like chiplets and heterogeneous integration, uh, 3D, HI, all those types of things. And then we'll talk about uh, uh, really a little in a little more detail about the differences between three-dimensional packaging and silicon stacking or what some people call 3D HI or 3D IC, and then we'll wrap it up. So um, I, I've used this slide to kind of explain our view of really what's happening in the industry um, as we see more people kind of pivoting away from Moore's Law uh, and into these more than more types of, of technologies that we see here. So it's many people's view in the industry today that just simply following Moore's Law with your next generation of design is it's just not the best competitive path forward from an economical perspective or a technical perspective because of some advancements in, in packaging and chiplets and those types of things. So the, the factors that are kind of driving everyone to move to heterogeneous integration are shown here. I'll start in the upper left. It's probably the most Im important reason or, or top reason why people are, are pivoting to 3, 3DHI and that is cost essentially. And Cost is tied very closely to size, which is tied very closely to yield. And what we have seen over the last few years in the SOC space is chips designed so big, they run out of, they're, they're too big, big to be manufactured. They reach what's called the maximum reticle limit. So those chips cannot actually be fabricated uh, with the lithography equipment we have today. And so that's one reason to start to look at building multiple chips. Um, and, and, and by the way, when you build chips that are near the reticle limit, they don't yield very well anyways. That was, the, you know, Xilinx example 10, 12 years ago, where they took a big FPGA and repartitioned it into four partitions, put it on a silicon interposer. And that was, some would argue, the, the birth of this, this world of, of heterogeneous integration. Um, so, and, and of course, designing, you know, something at five nanometers and three nanometers gets, you know, well over a half a billion dollars in all, once you're all in. So if you're designing a product that maybe isn't super high volume, something in aerospace and defense, for example, that you're not going to build hundreds of thousands of, or millions of, of devices, uh, it's impossible to recoup the NRE. Uh, for those lower volume types of products. So that's why we see a lot of companies that are in that space uh, leading the way um, in this push towards heterogeneous integration. Uh, furthermore, on the lower left there, um, analog, RF, and IO, and memory. So we, on these system on chips, we see more and more analog and RF content. There's more IO, moving signals on and off the chip, and more memory in, in an effort to try and break down the memory wall. Those are technologies that historically haven't taken advantage of Moore's law, which is basically getting double the number of transistors every couple of years for a lower cost. And just simply scaling transistors doesn't really apply uh, in the world of analog RF in IO for sure, where you want big transistors driving and receiving signals and even in memory. So because of that, you see a lot of today's heterogeneous integration uh, really based on separating the I.O., so se separating high-speed certies off, off the die, taking memory and, and moving it off the die, taking analog and, and moving it off the die. So those, that's another factor, um, and that kind of ties into the upper right there, which is really, you're talking about lowering, sorry about that, let me turn on my 
pointer here. Turn this on. And that's really about lowering the so-called memory wall. And we've seen examples of this. The, the upper left there where my cursor is right now is how we used to do it back in the day. We had these DIM cards with DRAM devices side by side that inserted through to a connector onto a PCB and the signal then had to go through the PCB and through the packaging uh, interconnect onto the processor. So we've greatly lowered that wall by moving, first of all, taking the DRAM, stacking them, most commonly uh, method for that is H HBM, and then moving those HBM stacks in very close to the processing uh, processor device inside the actual package sometimes with bridges, sometimes with interposers. Um, and we also see some examples of wafer, full wafer on wafer stacks where people are st uh, stacking processor logic with full uh, wafer of memory devices for typically for AI, ML types of applications. And then some, I think a lot of those are pretty obvious to a lot of people that are in the industry. The one that's a little, maybe not quite as obvious, obvious is this one on the lower right here. And and we really call it form factor. And so we see uh, with Im implanted uh, devices or devices that maybe need to fit in the frame of your eyeglasses, um, people running out of two dimensional space and needing to integrate in three dimensions to fit in these very unusual form factors. That's by far not the, the primary reason, but we do see some people moving to 3D uh, HI for those for that factor. So there are other reasons as well, but these are kind of the main factors really pushing a lot of the industry to three-dimensional heterogeneous integration. So the next slide here uh, is uh, gives you our perspective of what is heterogeneous integration, what are chiplets, and how does all this compare to what we've been doing for 50 years with multi-chip modules. So on the left-hand side, is how we typically, where MCMs came from. And they were typically an effort to reduce swap, size, weight, and power uh, of the PCB. So we took the die out of their packages on the PCB and mounted those bare die onto some sort of module, sometimes a ceramic module, most recently uh, laminate types of substrates, but those are fully functional die. We attach those with wire bond or flip chip. And that is the market that we called multi-chip module and system and package. Some people use the term MCP or multi-chip package. Um, those designs are absolutely heterogeneously integrated. We mix GAN, GAS, CMOS. We mix multiple nodes. We, we didn't care, but we didn't use the term in the packaging community. We didn't use the term heterogeneous integration. Uh, even though we were doing it, we were also doing stacking and packaging. But the term really came up based on what's happening on the right-hand side of the picture here. And this is really why there's so much attention now around heterogeneous integration. And that is the traditional ASIC and SOC designers are now pivoting to packaging or disaggregation of their SOCs based on the, the first slide that I, I shared. So based on the cost and other factors, they're actually dis, looking at disaggregated approaches to designing their next generation chip. And so they're taking different parts of the chip. We've talked about IO and things like SRAM, um, but they're basically splitting the chip into multiple chiplets. So that's a little bit different than what we did on the left-hand side with multi-chip modules where they're fully functional die. This is taking a fully functional die and disaggregating it into these smaller building blocks. Uh, and there's lots of good reasons why we do that that we'll, we'll be talking about. Um, so that, that's where the term heterogeneous integration came from, or HI, is really as the ASIC and SOC designers started pivoting from away from monolithic SOCs because of cost and other factors that we previously talked about. Um, and that's kind of where, where, we, where we see the term coming from. So have we been heterogeneously integrating things for a long time? Yes, we have. But the, the term is really being used primarily on the right-hand side of this picture, and that's as ASIC and SOC designers enter the world of multi-chiplet packaging. And that takes me to this slide, um, which is another sometimes a, a bit of a point of contention or confusion uh, when, when companies, especially chip designers, are moving to this world, and they say, I'm, just, I'm moving to heterogeneous integration, thinking that's a packaging term which is not heterogeneous integration, as I just described, just means you're gonna disaggregate your what you were gonna build in your chip into these chiplets 
And then it's the packaging that actually aggregates them back together or does the assembly of those multiple chiplets. And there is no one way to aggregate these chiplets. Um, you know, there's common things like silicon interposers, uh, bridges, both elevated and embedded. Um, there's people that use ultra high density RDLs. We're, the really advanced stuff is moving to silicon stacking. Um, and we also see, um, you know, now some lower cost interposers made out of a very thin film organic uh, material getting to the same sort of geometries as silicon. Um, they're typically called RDL interposers. And we see, you know, stacking weights, full stacker, uh, stacks of wafers and co-packaged optics coming. So these are all, these are not all the packaging technologies out there, but that's a sample of the different types of packages being used today to aggregate this heterogeneously integrated packaging. So I'll stop there. If there are any questions about our perspective on, on this term heterogeneous integration or comments, questions? No, not at this point, so. Okay, great. Okay, so what does that mean for, uh, from a tool provider's perspective as we develop tools to address the challenges of these next generation designs? And I would say the overarching uh, uh, challenge that we see uh, and our customers see is the fact that these two worlds of system design and ASIC design are merging together, they're converging. And so what that means is now the number of tools uh, in your flow will likely grow. For example, if you're designing chips and then integrating multiple chiplets together, you need to do the compliance that validates that the chiplet A is connected correctly to chiplet B using UCIE or whatever the interface is. So that's a signal integrity type of challenge that if you're an ASIC designer, you may have never even heard the term signal integrity, but it's something we've been doing on the system side for a long time. The opposite example is if you're a package designer that's been designing laminate forever and now you're moving to more foundry-based packaging technologies, you have to go through a formal sign-off process of DRC and LVS. Um, it's, it's much a much more for, formal um, process to move your data into manufacturing. So everyone, there are challenges on both sides of this, whether you're coming at it from a package designer's perspective or whether you're coming at 3DHI from a chip designer's perspective, there are plenty of challenges to go around and we'll talk about uh, some of those challenges. But the overarching one is really the fact that you need more expertise bridging across ASIC design and system design. Um, and you need potentially you know, more uh, advanced flows that have more tools within those flows because you have to do uh, more levels of verification, more steps of, of, uh, of thermal, other things that we'll talk about as we get into the next few slides. So if you are a package designer and you've been around for a while, uh, you probably can remember back not that long ago where packaging was really considered a necessary evil. We were in the, uh, those of us in packaging. It was our job just really to protect the chip, spread the IO out so the board designer could connect to them. But most importantly, don't hurt the chip. Cause no damage was really about and, and do it at the lowest possible cost you can do it. And so, you know, it wasn't a great time to be in the package design space. Um, because it was not, there was not really considered to be any value add in, in the packaging of the past. As we move into today's world of 3DHI, that completely changes. Now companies are looking to packaging to actually add value to their products. So um, the old packaging of, you know, do it as cheap as you can and don't hurt my chip, that's completely goes away now. And so it's a great time to be in packaging because all the attention is here. Uh, companies are investing. Um, I met with a large semiconductor company about a month ago, and their VP of engineering said in two years, he expects his package design team to be as large as his ASIC design team and have the same budget. So packaging is, is really exploding right now. It's where people are, are adding unique value to their products that, that they're providing to their customers. So it's a great time to be in the packaging space. Um, how's the packaging space uh, kind of uh, evolving. Uh, that really is this slide here talking about how we've kind of transitioned over uh, the last 30, 40 years. Um, historically, pre-1989, packaging was typically either a chip on board or packaged in a lead frame mechanical 
device. Um, so it was mechanical tools that were used. Um, again, there wasn't a lot of value in that. Um, and that all changed in 89 when Motorola came out with the ball grid array. And at that time, we called that advanced packaging. Uh, and that was really moving away from this mechanical structure into more of a PCB-like structure. So a multi-layer substrate um, with routing, with plane generation, all the things that you, a lot of things you would see on a PCB process then became into the, the world of packaging. And um, and this is about when Cadence got in the industry was the early 90s and, our, and developed technology based largely on our, our PCB technology. And over the years, we've uh, um, extended that technology um, beyond just laminate, simple laminates with multi-die, wire bond, flip chip attach into three dimensions, package on package, uh, supporting you know, uh, interconnect bridges, uh, supporting some of the new organic based interposers. So we were able to leverage that PCB-like technology, as I pointed out, to, to kind of you know, approach this, these really next generation types of packages. However, we move into the, the, the hybrid side of things. This is where the flows, um, so these flows over here are pretty, they're basically system-based flows. Um, when we move into the middle here, the hybrid design, this is where you really see that combination of tools and expertise you would see on the system side, as well as tools and expertise you would see on the ASIC design side of the flow. So I gave some examples now with fan out wafer level packaging. If you're using ultra high density RDL, um, that's typically built in a foundry process. So there are formal uh, steps for uh, physical verification. There are uh, requirements to improve yield around metal balancing um, so that it really takes the package designer's expertise and starts to blend in the expertise and the tools from the ASIC side. And the same applies to interposers. Now, if we move fully to the right here, this is really the next generation. This is, and I would argue, it may, might not have much to do with chiplets. Um, and that is die stacking, where now ASIC designers have the ability to design in the third dimension. So they're going to use, this is going to be done in a die design tool. Because these, these types of flows shown on the left, we've worked it with abstract representations of the die, usually die extents, locations of the, the, the C4 bumps, the pin label on that, maybe a few other things, but that's what we were able to, you know, an IO muff, uh, buffer model, things like that. We were able to design very advanced packages. As we move to die stacking, that no longer applies. So if you're designing a digital chip, you need to have the representation down to the standard cell level uh, and the, all, all the rep details of the IP because you're just taking and designing it in the third dimension now. And the most common use model today is SRAM stacking. So L3, L4 cache that on a big die placed in a, in a, in a planar fashion would be very far away from the processing logic. Now you have the ability to take that level three, L level four cache and put it directly above the processing logic in, a, in the third dimension. So this is um, really where the, the, the world is, is, is really starting to change in this uh, true silicon stacking. Uh, and requires a different set of expertise and a different set of tools. And I'll talk a little bit more detail about that uh, coming up. So, but again, these types of designs still sit typically on some sort of BGA or LGA package. So packaging never goes away. Lead frame never went away. BGAs never go away. We just add more capability, more functionality. So little detail about what, why are these different technologies, 3D packages versus silicon stacking? and really chiplet-based architectures versus uh, uh, silicon stacking. So left-hand side here, we typically have these solder-based connections, micro bumps that, um, uh, and each die is essentially designed independently. And then the package designer simply stacks them all together, makes sure it functionally works with, you know, thermally is, go is going to work. Uh, they do the modeling uh, using the signal integrity tool. So it's a buffer to buffer type of signaling. So it's a transmit receive chant going through some parasitic channel, uh, just like you would see on a, on a PCB. And, you know, there are standards out there today, probably the most, uh, the one that has the most attention is UCIE, but there's also BOW, uh, HBI and AIB are probably going to go away, but there might be some others that come. So you're working just like a board designer would work with a PCI interface or, D, or DDR interface. Um, it's a similar thing. It's just a different type of interface, but it's something the board designers 
and, and, and MCM designers have known how to do for a long time. When you move to the right-hand side, and by the way, this can be done with black box representations of the die. When you move to the right-hand side, this is that world of silicon stacking. What we see today is it's simply, it typically is a single RTL that comes into the designer. So it's a single logical representation of the die. And then once they're in the physical floor planning tool, they start to partition you know, different uh, functionality onto different layers. And as I said, so SRAM is the most common to get stacked there. But this type of uh, design environment requires you to work down to the details of the chip, down to the transistor level if you're working on an analog chip, because you're not you're not having this isolation of a chiplet that has a pad ring around it that has a little micro buffer. In this case, it's just a flop to flop signal that goes through a tiny little hybrid bond pad. So there is no really hard barrier between each of the chiplets. It's a very soft barrier, just a small little parasitic couple micron uh, metal connection that happens there. So this requires a totally different set of expertise, requires static timing tools, timing driven routing, three-dimensional placement, uh, you know, very advanced IC types of capabilities versus the left-hand side, which is more system or packaging types of technologies. So John, oh. just a, a point of clarification, the silicon stacking, the, um, the pieces are still fabricated as separate wafers and then stacked, but not using a solder interconnect versus people who are doing vertical transistors and just putting more metal layers in the design. Right. Correct. Yes. Yep. It's simply just doing. A, I mean, we still we have three dimensional stack transistors to now. This is just creating two different tiers. Of pa it's like you know playing two D chess, and then you add a th three dimension to it. So you're you're playing sort of the same game, but there's now just more complexity involving a, a different level of the design. All right. So let's talk about some of the challenges uh, on the ecosystem side. So 3D HI sounds new and exciting and you know, lots of people wanna jump in, but there are a lot of challenges. Um, number one is, and this is a whole talk within itself, are, des are something called assembly design kits or ADKs. Uh, when you design a chip, you get something called a PDK, process design kit. So you go to the foundry that's building your chip. They're gonna give you tech files to set up your layers and layers of your, your chip. They're gonna give you libraries of standard cells and IOs. They're gonna give you probably most importantly, sign off rule decks so that what you produce from your CAD tool, they can guarantee it can be built because it passes the, the DRC and LDS checks that the manufacturer provides. So it's a very formal process in designing a chip. In packaging, a lot less formal. It's more like the wild west. It's uh, there's a lot of uh, unknowns, a lot of interaction with your OSAT, you know, sharing emails, calling their application people, working with their design center, what it, whatever it might happen to be. Um, it's, a, it's not a, a process like design. It's not as formal as designing a chip. So, and as, as these chip designers sort of enter this market of 3DHI, the first thing they look for is something equivalent to a PDK. So there's been a push. Um, there are there's been a lot of progress, I would say, over the last year in assembly design kits, where maybe two years ago nobody was talking about it. Today, um, there are lots of people talking about. It. There are some people actually starting to provide assembly design kits. So we've made a lot of progress uh, with in this area in the last um, certainly in the last year. Um, on the right hand side here, consumer off the shelf chiplets, another. Uh, another thing that not, not a lot of people understand is chiplets are not readily available uh, just you know in a storefront. You can't open a DigiKey or an Arrow catalog and pick your 15 chiplets and then add your one special sauce chiplet and have a product like we do with PCBs. That that's the that's the vision. That's where the industry wants to go is to be able to provide lots and lots of chiplets, known good chiplets and and be able to you know, grab those from a catalog, add your own and create a product. We're a long, long, long ways away from that. Not as far as we were a couple of years ago because we have made progress in standards. So I mentioned UCIE, BOW. So we have some good progress in standards for chiplet to chiplet communication. We now have some, made some progress in kind of chiplet exchange formats with CDX and 3D blocks out of TSMC. Uh, and there is a, a consortium uh, that's, 
uh, that's been formed called Chiplet US. Um, that's getting that's getting some government uh, funding because that a lot of this, of course, plugs into the Chips Act that I think a lot of people are familiar with. Um, and so there is it is progress in having more readily available a storefront, if you will, for chiplets. But right now, uh, in most cases, chiplets are within large vertically comp integrated companies. So the same company designed the chiplet, they use it internally for all the advantages we talk about, but they don't necessarily share that chiplet to the outside world, especially to their competitors. So that's an evolving space. Um, other challenges, again, are the design flows. I think that's really the point of my presentation. That's these design flows get very, very complex um, because the number of tools grow and thermal becomes you know, a key part and it has to be done in a much earlier uh, part of the design process. Um, he, he, uh, capacity is another um, area to pay attention to or you know, adding more and more capability, more functionality that typically means uh, the tools need to be you know, capable of handing, handling much larger structures, potentially billions of instances in a design. And on the analysis side, we of course have lots of new challenges there. Um, STA, when you're doing a, a silicon stack, the, the number of corners grows significantly. So when we close on STA, we close across um, process variation, temperature variation, power variation, and the more chiplets in that just grows the number of corners and you have to make sure you've got an advanced STA tool, for example. Um, System LBS, this is a, again, another long talk within itself. Um, something, and it's also something often people forget. And that is the ability to formally validate that your stack is stacked correctly together. All the hybrid bonds, all the micro bumps, everything is aligned correctly and that it's connected, that chiplet A is connected correctly through the interposer to chiplet B. Um, and so there, that you need to think about system LVS vary in the design flow because you have to have the golden net list that provides the, the input into that system LVS tool to remove spreadsheet checking from your flow and, 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 and really formalize and, um, the back end uh, LVS part of your design flow. There's lots, lots of other new challenges that are, that are coming up, but um, we're limited, unfortunately, today by time. So I want to skip to some some important things that are uh, uh, should be considered with your next uh, design flow. So if you're an ASIC designer and moving to this world of 3DHI, one of the first things that you need to consider is that aggregation cockpit. So we talked about the disaggregation of the chip and then packaging aggregates it. So you need a tool that allows you to bring in chiplets and chips and different packaging configurations, in some cases, even the PCB for the purposes of planning and optimizing that net list across those, those three dimensional aspects of the design. And you end up kind of with a picture on the right here that is meant to drive into your uh, detailed implementation tools. This is also, as you certainly in silicon stacking, thermal now needs to be done long before place and route. So if you've done all your detailed place and route and spent all months and months doing that and then try and make your device stack it three dimensionally and try to make it work thermally, you might've just wasted a lot of time. So there's new technology out here that allows you to enter parametric data, uh, describe you know power dissipation of each of the chiplet and the materials that are used for the molding and how things are oriented, how big the board is, if the board doesn't exist yet, and, and get some pretty detailed um, results of how your stack is gonna perform from a thermal perspective. And then again, this is that system LVS thing where you wanna, at the end of the day, you need to sign off that this whole stack, so the BGA through the, the interposer, um, that each of these chiplets is connected correctly and that each of the, the interfaces are aligned in the third dimension. So lots more to that, but those are things to consider. It should support standards. Um, uh, you know, There's lots of different standards, both on the die side, as well as the packaging side. So it's important to have a tool to be able to support lots of different industry standards. If you're not familiar with TSMC blocks, I suggest Googling it and, and, and be making yourself familiar with it. It's an exciting new technology that uh, allows you to formally verify your three-dimensional floor plan using a very formal uh, verification process. And we talked about eight assembly design kits, important factor there. And of course, the this tool should support an ECO accept reject flow through, uh, throughout the uh, impl different implementation tools. 
Uh, we talked about some of the challenges uh, from the, the actual implementation side of things. So as you move to Stack Silicon, again, your data, you have to have a, a layout database that can support multiple tech lefts or multiple PDKs because you're designing potentially heterogeneously. So you have to, the traditional IC place and route tools, monolithic die design, one tech left or one PDK, that doesn't work anymore in the, in the world of silicon stacking. You need a tool that can support multiple tech lefts um, across different technologies. You need a, your, your placing algorithms need to be more sophisticated and support the three-dimensional uh, placement of that. Um, T, TSVs are gonna be used even in face-to-face because -face, one, the die has to attach to the package. So the automation of TSVs, which take up a huge amount of space is very uh, important. 3D visualization, uh, you know, a lot of people think, oh, it's just, it's not, it, it, 3D vis visualization DRC becomes hugely important when you move to these types of designs. And of course, pack, uh, being able to co-design with uh, the package uh, design tools. If you're a package designer moving to this world, there are also challenges for you. Um, your next generation tool should account, you know, have a very flexible connectivity model. Traditional packaging was really, a lot of it was con connectivity on the fly. Uh, now you have a formal system LVS, so you need a formal connectivity tool to drive that. Um, more, again, again, advancements in 3D stacking, more capability to integrate in with the physical verification tools. You have to sign off on, on DRC and LVS and do much more advanced degassing or, or metal balancing in the packages. So there are a lot of challenges also uh, that face the, the next generation of package designers as they move into the world of 3DHI. So in conclusion, um, you know, we've, we've leveraged Moore's Law. We've taken advantage of Moore's Law for three or four decades now. Um, and that was great. And, um, but things are changing and really the, the economics don't make sense and haven't for many companies in quite some quite a while and simply just basing all your designs on the on on, on Moore's law. Um, did Gordon Moore know this? Probably because in his paper that he wrote, he at the end of it, on the third page of it, he actually says that, you know, in the future it might be more economical to build these large systems out of smaller functions. So he in fact probably did predict where we are today with 3DHI. Um, packaging is is the center of the universe right now. The, the board designers look to packaging to reduce swap. And now ASIC designers are looking to packaging to create a more modularized, cost-effective uh, product. And so here we are in what many call the more than more world, um, which of course brings a lot of new challenges. And with those new challenges are lots of new opportunities. And that concludes my presentation. Thank you. Any questions? Yes. Uh, thank you, John. Some uh, quick questions here. Um, with the head, you talked about heterogeneous integration enable, well, you know, larger devices than the radical limit. But a question was, how does it enable substrates larger than the radical? How does, so, you, so substrates, if it's a laminate substrate, it's a different manufacturing process. A panel, it's a different thing. If it is a silicon uh, process, you can stitch across multiple, so you can do, 1.5x, 2x, where you're actually stitching two die together and build a big, a larger interposer out of that. So that's how you're able, and but building a chip that way would never, the problem becomes really, as I said, as you start to build chips that are at that reticle limit, they don't yield. That I mean, their yield is horrible, which drives up the cost. And so, but that you don't have that same sort of impact if you're designing a, an interposer, which is doesn't have, you know, I'm talking about a passive interposer here. So it's just metallization layers. There's no front end line of process, processing or no devices on that. Okay, good. Okay, let me um, do a few more really quickly. Um, what's the difference between hybrid bond and uh, copper to copper bonding? That uh, I think the industry really just uses, so, you know, the DBI was the, at least the first technology I could, heard of direct bonding. Um, and I think they own a lot of the, you know, the patents on this technology, but a, a lot of people use, you know, hybrid bond, copper to copper, direct bonding. There are lots of different terms. Um, I don't, I'm not familiar personally with who owns all the patents and how, you know, who, who you need to license what through. I would talk to your, your foundry or your OSAT to find out um, 
you know, who they're, what technology specifically they're using and who they're licensing through, or maybe they have their own uh, unique tech, uh, technology. But to me, it's all the same sort of uh, connections. It's not doing a solder based connection. It's just doing a metal metal, the, like DBI, it's a low temperature annealing process that the dielectrics essentially glue together. Yeah. Okay. Um, and uh, I, I know, I believe that I know the answer here, but people are asking, you know, when you're doing the silicon stacking, is there going to be ESD diodes in the IO? Or as you said, is it just directly from flip-flop to flip-flop? Yeah. So it, that's how the designs we've seen today, which and again, are mostly SRAM stacking. It's just you know, a bunch of uh, a bunch of wires going between the designs. It's not like a chiplet where it would be a little ring of micro buffers that you know handle level shifting, drive the UCI interface, that type of thing. It's simply a you know just a metal connection through the design. In doesn't mean things won't change, but you know one of the challenges here is really you know we if we look at this world of chiplets. Um, if you want full flexibility of a chiplet, how does it need to be built, right? Do you need it with a DBI, with a direct bond connection? Maybe. Do you need it with a micro bump connection? It's got to have TSVs, even if it's place to place, because you don't know how the end user is going to put it in their 3D stack. So it's, um, you know, it's on really lots and lots of different uh, of levels of capability there with today, not a lot of standards saying this is exactly how you need to do it. So uh, I don't know if that answers it, but that's okay. okay. Well, 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 one, one last question. Uh, you talked about the need to do your thermal planning before you're doing your placement or at the same time. Yep. Um, what about thermal features like uh, through silicon vias for thermal and things like that? Do you see people having to do their stack and then have to redo their IC floor plan to add those thermal features? Like yes. So that's why you want to do it. That's why you can't wait exactly till, till you, if you have all the detail place and route done, it's too late really to you're starting, starting over. But if you start planning in, you know, very early when you're starting just the floor planning stages and, you know, determining locations of TSVs and how big they're going to be, how much, you know, heat they can display all these different things then uh then yes that's and that's capability that's out there today um in, in our case it uses the same technology for thermal sign off as it does for thermal planning okay good thank you john sure. um there's a few other questions in the q a tool maybe you want to respond to some of them okay. if you have time all right uh, but really in, in a great presentation thank you and then once again, I would like to thank our uh, lead sponsor, Adventist, rated as the number one supplier of semiconductor equipment um, in 2022. And our other sponsors, Omcor and Cadence, their sponsorship has made this event possible and free of charge. So when you have an opportunity, please thank them. And I thank all of you for joining us today. And we look forward to seeing you tomorrow. Have a good rest of your day.